Um, we're very pleased to partner with Haverford Trust, and you'll see him uh, see them up on the on the screen here. And uh, I know Tim Gillespie, but all I can see is darkness out there, Tim and uh, Joe McLaughlin. Um, and so let's thank them for making Read the Revolution possible this evening. <laughs> Now, it's a real pleasure to be uh, welcoming Dr. Vincent Brown this evening, and um, as is um, sometimes the case, but not all that often, it's, we're, we're actually welcoming a, a good friend to the museum here uh, this evening. Um, Vince was uh, a, one of the group of scholars who consulted with us during the development of the exhibitions and interactives for the museum here, so long before the shovel was in the ground and the steel began rising here at Third and Chestnut in Philadelphia, we were um, you know, tapping Vince's brain for exciting stories of uh, the American Revolution, some of which really turned into some of those great personal stories in our core exhibition here. Um, Vince is the Charles Warren Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American History at um, Harvard University. He is the author of The Reaper's Garden, which won the James A. Raleigh Prize, the Louis Gottschalk Prize, and the Merle Curti Award. If you have an opportunity to go online, don't do it right now on your phones, but uh, when you get home, he's uh, developed an online interactive map called Slave Revolt in Jamaica, 1760-61, and it's a, a cartographic narrative, so you can go online, actually a lot of the themes, and you may even be speaking about this a little bit during your your talk this evening, um, but it's a, a great online resource and hopefully will begin uh, to be used by educators in classrooms. Uh, he's received Guggenheim and Mellon Newton Directions Fellowships. His documentary, uh, Herzegovitz in the Heart of Blackness, was um, broadcast nationally on PBS and it received the John E. O'Connor Film Award and it was chosen as the best documentary at the Hollywood Black Film Festival, so you'll definitely want to check that out. Now, in 2017, for those of you who were here on April 19th when we opened the Museum of the American Revolution, uh, Vincent Brown was one of our absolutely stunning keynote speakers. Um, um, it's, uh, you know, we went back and read your, read your uh, a transcript of your comments that day, and they continue to inspire us. Um, you more recently might have seen him uh, interviewed on a CBS Sunday Morning piece that's about the museum. And all of these pieces are available on the museum's website. Um, if you just search for Museum of the American Revolution or amrev.org, you'll be able to find all, all of that information. So we've got a little sizzle reel to introduce um, Vincent Brown because Lonnie Bunch had one and we thought you, you ought to at least get that same treatment. Uh, and then we're going to warmly welcome Vincent Brown. But loyalty to a cause, high ideals, and the courage to carry them out. But we appreciate the efforts of common women, men, and children of all sorts, their losses as well as their victories, and the determination to turn those losses into lessons. The history of revolution is and should be a living history, as alive in the aspirations of the present as it was in the dreams and deeds of the past. This kind of history is messy and contradictory, tragic and ironic, as often as it is heroic. It also has the virtue of being closer to the truth. So I'm grateful, deeply grateful, to the curators of this exhibit for having the courage to tell that truth, to show us not only a proud story of national origin, but a multifaceted account of how one might have experienced a time of such turmoil. Sizzle I did not expect a sizzle reel. I thought I was going to have to provide all the sizzle myself, and now I can just, now I can lay back and relax. I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much, Scott, for that um, lovely, lovely introduction. Um, maybe over generous introduction, but it was fantastic. Um, but also, thank you for all the fantastic work that you do here at the museum <clears throat> and for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, I also want to thank Hannah Betcher uh, and Alex McKechnie for arranging my appearance here, um, Ryan and David, for holding, uh, holding down the tech. Um, and thanks to uh, all of you for coming out tonight. 
uh, I very much appreciate you and your interest in history, uh, and especially your interest in histories that you don't know, and history that, that you'd like to explore. I really appreciate that. Um, it's kind of a homecoming for me in a way because I consulted early on the museum, but also because I was at the opening, but also because uh, Phil Mead is one of the curators here, and he was a graduate student of ours at Harvard University, and he's doing amazing work, and I'm, I'm so proud of him that it's really nice to kind of, you know, be here to help support him. And I'm extremely honored to have Laurel Thatcher Ulrich in the audience with us tonight, who was um, kind of one of the leading lights of early American and, and, and American Revolution history in the country, but also especially at Harvard University, where she was instrumental in hiring me. Uh, and, I, and I am still grateful, not sure why you did it, but I'm still grateful that you, that you did. Um, so it's great to see you. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm honored to be with you here, um, and I'm hoping that maybe we can all catch a bit of the spirit of revolution together before it's too late. So in 1776, Great Britain's most important American colony was on the verge of insurrection. Colonists perceived that the government in Britain was conspiring against the rights of imperial subjects. They feared a plot against the English liberties they had long enjoyed. At their dinner tables, they heatedly discussed the merits of open sedition. Those disaffected with imperial governance dwelled upon the topic of American rebellion. As these Jamaican colonists debated liberty, their slaves saw an opportunity. The island was at a critical juncture with the British entry into yet another imperial war. Colonists traded exaggerated accounts of a French and Spanish military buildup in the Caribbean and calculated that there were 30 slaves to every white person, ready to join, they said, the attempts of any enemy in a general massacre. On July 3rd, a regiment of troops left Hanover Parish for a rendezvous at Port Royal, scheduled to depart the island for North America by the end of the month. Throughout that parish, enslaved people gathered frequently in houses, grounds, and open fields to hold very serious conversations, which stopped suddenly upon the approach of anyone they did not trust. They were strategizing. Now or never, they thought, was the time to make themselves masters of the country. The moment seemed right for a successful uprising, but this American Revolution was not to be. As so often happened with slave rebellions, the plot was betrayed and the conspiracy unraveled. When the British in Jamaica considered the gravity of their predicament in 1776, rather than looking ahead to the loss of the 13 colonies on the North American continent, they looked to the past, back to the slave insurrection of 1760, which had been the most dangerous threat to the British Empire to date. They reflected on the differences between the unrest of 1760 and 1776, mostly in terms of the nature of warfare with their own slaves. 1776 customarily marks a more moment in the origin of the United States of America, when the Declaration of Independence announced the separation of the 13 colonies from Great Britain. When referring to the origins of the nation, though, the date obscures the broader context of the times. It deflects attention from the fact that Britain held 26 colonies in America, not just the 13 that broke away, and that by far the most profitable, militarily significant, and politically connected of them were in the Caribbean. This chart compares private wealth in various regions of Great Britain's empire in 1774. It divides the territories into England and Wales, British America as a whole, and then the 13 North American colonies that became the United States, those in the British Caribbean, and then divides the 13 colonies into three regions, Southern, Mid-Atlantic, and New England. As you can see, colonists on the continent held nearly 70% of the wealth in British America, largely because the total population of property holders was much larger than in the Caribbean. But when you break North America down by region, you see that wealth increased as you move south. That is, according to the degree the colonial economy depended upon enslaved labor. And when you examine the average amount of property held per free white person, an astonishing disparity drop leaps out. In the British Caribbean, 
where some 90% of the population was made up of enslaved black people. Free white people were stupendously rich, boasting more than 17 times the wealth of those in the 13 colonies. Indeed, the average private wealth of a free white colonist in Jamaica, the single most lucrative American colony, was nearly 58 times greater than that of a similar settler in New England. Military deployments were distributed to protect that wealth. Often, there were nearly as many warships assigned to Jamaica as to the whole of the North American continent. And Jamaica's planters and merchants wielded greater influence in the imperial metropolis than their North American peers. This might go some way to explaining why poor Governor Thomas Hutchinson couldn't get as much support as he needed as soon as he wanted from British policymakers when rebels rose up in Massachusetts in the 1770s. Before that American Revolution, the British were well aware that the event we now know as Tacky's Revolt represented the peak of imperial crisis, and slave revolt was generally a source of overwhelming concern. Taking advantage of Britain's Seven Years' War against its European opponents, more than 1,000 enslaved black people on Jamaica launched a series of uprisings which began on April 7, 1760, and continued into the next year. Over the course of 18 months, the rebels managed to kill 60 whites and destroy tens of thousands of pounds worth of property. During the suppression of the revolt and the repression that followed, over 500 black men and women were killed in battle, executed, or driven to suicide. Another 500 were transported from the island for life. One planter, who had lived through the upheaval, wrote, <clears throat> whether we consider the extent and secrecy of its plan, the multitude of the conspirators, and the difficulty of opposing its eruptions in such a variety of places at once, this revolt was more formidable than any hitherto known in the West Indies. According to two slaveholders who wrote histories of the Jamaican conflict, one of them being Edward Long, pictured here, the rebellion arose at the instigation of an African man named Taki, who had been a chief in Guinea, and was organized and executed principally by people called Koro. that convulsed the 18th century Atlantic world. The slave trade spread to people from Atlantic Africa throughout the Americas. Some who had been leaders or soldiers suddenly found themselves uprooted from sustaining landscapes, scattered by trade winds and currents, and replanted into unfamiliar territories where they labored to rebuild their social lives. Inevitably, some of them determined that only war could end their bondage. Mostly it was common people who found themselves caught up in slaving raids and expansionary wars, cast across the ocean, and set down in alien lands where slaveholders exploited and brutalized them. When new conflicts promised to liberate them or offered rewards for serving their masters, slaves might take up arms for whichever faction presented the prospect of a better life. This process of dispersal from a native land transplantation and adaptation to a strange new one is familiar to students of cultural change who have examined transformations in African religion, expression, and identity by viewing African American and Atlantic history in a common frame. A similar approach, my approach here, shows how the turmoil of enslavement and the daily hostilities of life in plantation society generated a militant response that traveled, took root, and sprouted in rebellions that reverberated across the Americas and back to Europe. That is what happened when those so-called Coromantes broke out in a series of revolts and conspiracies in the 17th and 18th centuries, most dramatically in Cartagena de Indias, Suriname, St. John, New York, Antigua, and Jamaica, an archipelago of insurrections stretching throughout the North Atlantic Americas. The Jamaican insurrections of 1760 to 61 followed by further uprisings in 65 and 66, were among the largest and most consequential of these. From what observers could glean of the aims and tactics of the rebels, it was clear that many had been soldiers in Africa. Perhaps whole cadres of people arrived in the Americas with military training and discipline. 
or at least some knowledge of defensive and evasive tactics learned in Africa. Indeed, as some scholars suggest, American slave revolts might be seen in key respects as extensions of African wars. This perspective reveals the complex networks of migration, belonging, trans-regional power, and conflict that gave the political history of the 18th century some of its most distinctive contours. Viewing slave revolt as a species of warfare is thus the first step to envisioning a map of Atlantic slavery that shows how political and military practices travel, take root, and grow in disparate environments. Even as the slave trade forced people to remake and renegotiate their affiliations, the massive dispersal of Africans across the Atlantic scattered the seeds of military conflict throughout the Americas. The story of the Coromantes shows how African warfare was reconstituted, not as a direct continuation of previous struggles, but as an outgrowth of immigrant experiences. British slaveholders valued Coromantes highly. Planters generally held that they were the best suited for agricultural labor, but said, at the same time, they are of a dangerous, rebellious disposition and promote disturbances. They were dangerous people to keep in bondage, perhaps in part, for the same reason slave traders found the Gold Coast to be an abundant source of potential workers. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the region witnessed the transformation of major empires, Denshira, Akwamu, Akim, and Ashante, among dozens of smaller polities, which vied for each other in the region. Fueled by arms sales from European traders, the wars that attended these contests produced great quantities of captives for sale to the Europeans on the coast. They also produced a turbulent environment in which complex military campaigns involved both European and African rivalries, multiple alliances, negotiations, and treachery. This context renders highly suspect the notion that people from the Gold Coast formed anything like a single ethnic group in Africa. But if they were not a discernible group in Africa, who were the Coromantes? According to the best research on the subject, they were members of a loosely structured organization of co-nationals who socialized with and aided one another, forming what contemporaries called a nation in the Americas. This was a diasporic phenomenon, a creative category, comprising people who shared or could understand a Khan, Ga, a Danme, and Ewe languages, recognizably familiar religious practices, and some broadly similar strategies for political incorporation. There was no direct antecedent to this ethnicity on the Gold Coast, where <clears throat> shared languages were not enough to supersede local divisions. Having taken its name from Cormancha, an important coastal town in the 17th century, the Cormanti nation in the Americas was both social glue and religious institution, functioning as a mutual aid society, burial group, and a place to enjoy entertainment. As a basis of social communion in, in an environment where militarism and brutality was a common experience, national gatherings could also provide a forum for people to plan, organize, and stage revolts. When they did so, they drew upon their previous military experiences. However, as a category of belonging, Coromanti was cross-cut by many other axes of identification. Coromantes spoke more than one language and came from many different regions and kingdoms from which they brought a variety of historical experiences. Just as importantly, once in Jamaica, they served different roles in slave society. So no amount of cultural similarity could resolve all the difficult negotiations of multiple interests and experiences among them. Even with their compatriots, enslaved people made friends and foes through a politics of belonging that made the debate about what it meant to be Coromanti in Jamaica as urgent as the forging of the identity itself. In the face of continual assaults on their personal and collective dignity, slaves distinguished themselves by their political commitments as much as by ascribed classifications. Among the Coromantes, different ideas of how to live in society, how to evade its worst abuses, and how to destroy it altogether shaped their rebelliousness even as they recalled their prior experiences in Africa. In the turbulent world of Atlantic warfare, nothing was more important than learning whether and how to form loyal units, alliances, and coalitions in the face of superior power. The enslaved had won this wisdom through hard experience on the Gold Coast, 
before coming to Africa, where they learned it anew and with different particulars in order to make war on their masters. The former slave and military veteran of the Seven Years' War, Olada Equiano, famously defined slavery itself as a perpetual state of war. This was not war in the conventional sense between distinct armies directed by the rulers of states. Rather, mastery was by its nature a forceful assault to be met with simmering violence ignited by the resentment against the fraud, rapine, and cruelty of slaveholders. To the slaveholders, Equiano asked, are you not hourly in dread of an insurrection? It was not a rhetorical question. Since the early days of Jamaica slave society, slaveholders had often considered the enslaved as, quote, irreconcilable and yet intestine enemies, made subject to the colonists only by the rule of the whip. Rebellion by slaves was a perennial anxiety, a war always the more terrible, one slaveholder wrote, by how much there is no quarter given in it. Equiano had been in Jamaica in 1772, with the island still reeling from the uprisings of the previous decade. There he had seen how an entire world could be organized around violence and counterattack on a continuous scale from the quotidian to the epic. He held this view in common with black people in other times and places, where the enslaved often characterized their bondage as a permanent state of low intensity war, talking regularly about how they might wage that war. Warfare migrates. This has never been more apparent than in the era when the violence of imperial expansion and enslavement transformed Europe, Africa, and the Americas as they interacted across the Atlantic Ocean. European imperial conflicts extended the dominion of capitalist agriculture. African battles fed captives to the transatlantic trade in slaves. Masters and their human property struggled with one another continuously. These clashes amounted to a borderless slave war War to enslave, war to expand slavery, and war against slaves, precipitating wars waged by the enslaved against slaveholders. In this sense, Taki's revolt was but a war within other wars, which had diverging and overlapping provocations, combat zones, political alliances, and enemy combatants. In effect, it combined four conflicts at once. It was an extension of wars on the African continent. It was a race war between black slaves and white slaveholders. It was a struggle among black people over the terms of their communal belonging for effective control of local territory and the establishment of their own political legacies. And it was, most immediately, one of the hardest fought battles of the Seven Years' War, the titanic global conflict between Great Britain and its European rivals. Each of these four struggles emerged from different currents that converged and eddied in the Jamaican insurrections of the 1760s. Charting their course suggests new stories of place, territory, and movement. Again, a new cartography of slave revolt that braids together the histories of Europe, Africa, and America. As an example, one of the revolt's principal leaders, a man called Wager, also known by his African name, Apongo, fought in each kind of these campaigns. He was an elite official on the Gold Coast, trading with British forts, and probably engaging in combat with political rivals. Captured and enslaved by a Royal Navy ship captain, he fought in naval battles against the French. He was a driver on that captain's sugar plantation, helping to keep other workers in subjection for a time, before he came to lead an uprising that the British could fairly call a race war. As he engaged in these successive struggles, he connected the small-scale, everyday violence of enslavement and coerced labor to the grand scale of imperial geopolitics. The hemispheric reach of these conflicts mapped interlocking patterns of state, commerce, migration, labor, and militancy. Across vast distances, these wars within wars connected the constituent elements of empire, diaspora, and insurrection. Such an integrated history of slave revolt takes us far from the plantations, beyond relations between masters and slaves, and outside the conventional locations for observing racial violence. 
Vectors of slave war in Jamaica formed a knot in the intertwined itineraries of soldiers who fought in Europe, North America, and Africa. Sailors who crisscrossed the Atlantic world for merchants and empires, and slaves who were swept up in many conflicts on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Tracking the movements of profiteers, warlords, workers, captives, and ordinary fighters exposes the shape of the Marshall Archipelago as peaks in a great volcanic network, constituting, I think, a world history from below. Now, I'm going to let you read uh, my account of the revolt for yourselves, hopefully. <laughs> No spoilers here. <clears throat> they lost. Um, you can get a glimpse of the way it unfolded on these maps. And I'm sorry, you probably can't read the text. The resolution isn't great enough, and it's, it's too small. But you can just get a general sense of kind of how complicated this revolt was, even over these first few months um, across several parishes of the island. For now, let me just sketch some of what I think are the revolt's underappreciated reverberations to give you a sense of why I think it was so important and how I hope the book can model the kinds of connections that braid events in distant places across long spans of time. Tacky's Revolt anticipated the American Revolution by a decade and a half and the Haitian Revolution by three decades. It can be considered one of the first great events of what historians call the Age of Revolution. And yet it is hardly known outside Jamaica to people who aren't historians of the British Empire or Atlantic slavery. This is despite the fact that it influenced two of the signal moments of the era, the reorganization of British imperial governance that so irritated colonists in North America, and the early beginning of the movement to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. So let me talk about each of those in turn. In the aftermath of the revolt, to recoup some of the public costs, Jamaica's House of Assembly passed new poll taxes and commercial duties. The colonial government also committed to a tax on vellum, parchment, and paper ascertained by stamps, something that imperial reformers would attempt a few years later for all of America. The Jamaica Stamp Act of 1760 was meant explicitly to address the cost of the revolt. That duty continued in force until December 1763, when it was replaced as too great a burden for all but the wealthiest colonists. As a model for the more contentious 1765 Stamp Act, that would rile the colonists in North America. The 1760 tax was an early local instance of a far larger reform effort stimulated by the Seven Years' War. As imperial policymakers celebrated military victories in North America, Africa, and the Caribbean, they contemplated the threat to their most vital colony. On November 7th, 1760, two weeks after the, get the death of King George II, the Board of Trade considered official accounts of the Jamaican insurrection, which raised the urgent question of how an expanding empire might, entertain, uh, might contain its internal antagonists. In this liminal moment for imperial management, a new policy would take shape. Now, British statesmen had worried over the governance of America for more than a decade, since the conclusion of the previous war with France and Spain in 1748. The colony's demographic, economic, and strategic value had increased dramatically in the first half of the 18th century, and the complexity of administering them had grown in tandem. British members of parliament were spurred into a reform effort, partly by the behavior of North American colonists during the Seven Years' War. In the midst of the conflict, colonial assemblies flouted the authority of governors. Elected officials allowed flagrant violation of the, of the Navigation Acts against trading with the enemy. And colonists often failed to supply enough local troops and resources to the war effort. As the historian Jack P. Green has explained, this coincided with a dramatic shift from an essentially permissive to a fundamentally restrictive philosophy of colonial administration in London, amplifying the widespread conviction that the colonies had too many privileges and that those privileges ought to be reduced. News of the slave war in Britain's most profitable colony strengthened the policymakers' resolve. In this, they were helped by a shift in attitude among the colonists in Jamaica. Jamaican colonists had previously been as restive and independent as their North American counterparts. But the slave insurrection reminded slaveholders of the benefits of empire. They soon conveyed their gratitude, along with the request for more troops, to the new King George III and the Lords of Trade. 
If not for his majesty's forces, the colonial government thanked the king, the lives and properties of your loyal subjects would in all likelihood have become a prey to their slaves. Slaveholders in Jamaica resented the influence of metropolitan intervention, as well as the imposition of new taxes. However, unlike so many in North America, their recent experience with slave revolt encouraged them to remain duly subject to imperial command, even passing that Stamp Act to help finance their own security. They did not like many imperial reforms, but they acquiesced to them. After the Seven Years' War, with Jamaica having served as a model for the assertion of imperial control, policymakers preferred a raft of new legislation for the North American colonies. colonies. Yet unlike colonial Jamaica's submission, these policies inspired the well-known backlash that would ultimately split the British Empire in 1776. If the Jamaican insurrections helped to shape imperial policy toward the colonies, they also offered a rationale for the reform of colonial slavery. Fearing further rebellion, concerned Britons put forth pragmatic plans for enhancing the security of the colonies by limiting their dependence on the slave trade and ameliorating the condition of the enslaved. Ironically, perhaps perversely, the work of the historian planter Edward Long had a significant impact on a budding anti-slavery discourse. In arguing that the principal threat to threats to colonial slavery were African and especially Coromante insurgents, Long promoted the idea that a native-born slave population would be more tractable. Long thought that if planters could avoid working their slaves to death, attach them to estates rather than continuing to scatter them by sale, establish better conditions for child rearing and encourage the progress of Christianity, then slaveholders might be more secure in their possessions. They could also save money on the ever-rising prices of imported laborers from Africa. Raising up native-born populations would facilitate what reformers constantly referred to as the improvement of the plantations and would lead to a kinder and gentler and less menacing slavery. Through the beginning of the 19th century, people who campaigned against the slave trade would invoke Long's text to argue that ending the traffic would enhance the internal security of the British Empire. In this way, Jamaica's turbulence indirectly helped to nurture the emerging anti-slavery slave trade movement. And fear of Africans had indeed inspired the first efforts to restrict the transatlantic slave trade. Responding to a 1712 uprising in New York City, the Pennsylvania Assembly imposed a prohibitive 20-pound duty on slave importations, citing diverse plots and insurrections not only in the islands, but on the mainland of America as the reason for their action. After the revolt near South Carolina's Stona River in 1739, that colony enacted a 10-year moratorium on the importation of Africans, but planters soon found that they could not do without them. Amid news of Jamaica's troubles in the 1760s, other colonies tried again. Virginia's legislators attempted to levy increased duties on imported slaves in 1767, 1769, and 1772. As Virginia's governor explained to British officials, colonists had, quote, just cause to apprehend the most dangerous consequence of importing Africans and should find means not only of preventing their increase, but also of lessening their number. He believed that the interest of the country would manifestly require the total expulsion of them. Influenced more by merchant interest than by colonial concerns, London disallowed all of these Virginia duty acts. Restrictions were more successful in Pennsylvania. In 1761, with news of Jamaica's slave war appearing regularly in the Pennsylvania Gazette, that colony's assembly noted the mischievous consequences attending the practice of importing slaves into this province. With their security at stake, many hoped to prohibit the trade entirely. In 1761, the colony passed a law to increase the import duties on slaves and extended its enforcement in perpetuity. In 1773, Pennsylvania doubled the impost and finally, in 1780, the colony passed an act for the gradual abolition of slavery. As much as these laws might have expressed increasing opposition to the practice of slaveholding, and that increasing opposition was quite genuine, they were also aimed at discouraging the arrival of potentially insurgent Africans. If most white colonists feared the presence of Africans, many others empathized with their plight. 
In the abolition movement's early beginnings, African rebels often drew sympathetic responses, especially from people in places that held fewer numbers of slaves than the Caribbean. Many British and North American readers were more horrified by the brutality of their British co-nationals than by the violence of the rebels. Accounts of the executions circulated more widely with the growing popularity of sentimental literature and Christian martyrology, which helped the British to imagine their nation as a moral community founded in persecution, death, and religious virtue. For some, this imagined community extended to include the enslaved, however tenuously, and African rebels came to be seen as victims sacrificed to the cruel tyranny of slaveholders. One pamphlet that circulated during the 1760 revolt, J. Fillmore's two dialogues on the man trade, argued that given the terrors of enslavement, nature's higher law authorized violence against enslavers. And I'm quoting, all the black men now on our plantations who are by unjust force deprived of their liberty and held in slavery as they have none upon earth to appeal to may lawfully re repel that force with force and to recover their liberty, destroy their oppressors. And not only so, but it is the duty of others, white as well as black, to assist those miserable creatures if they can in their attempts to deliver themselves out of slavery and to rescue them out of the hands of their cruel tyrants. Now, a few others are willing to go this far, at least in print. But the pamphlet influenced Anthony Benezet, the Pennsylvania Quaker who laid the intellectual foundations for slave trade abolition in the British Empire. Although he avoided the topic of slave revolts, he frequently invoked higher law doctrine against the trade in human beings. Among his fellow Quakers, a fervent opposition to war induced them to see the violence stimulated by slave trading as an unconscionable evil. Their belief that the slave trade was a constant source of war was an orthodox line of reasoning through the early 19th century. Even some who could not condone slave revolt could condemn slaveholder tyranny. In 1764, a Boston writer asserted that West Indian planters were used to an arbitrary and cruel government over slaves, having for so long tasted the sweets of oppressing their fellow creatures. That sentiment reverberated strongly in James Otis's Rights of the British Colonies Asserted and Proved, published the same year. His defense of the rights of American settlers from the intimidation of imperial administration declared that, quote, Colonists are by the law of nature freeborn, as indeed all men are, white or black. Now in England, people mocked American colonists' pretensions to being oppressed by evoking their brutality toward the enslaved. Anti-slavery rhetoric featured prominently in a 1768 London parliamentary campaign against the Jamaican slaveholder William Beckford, who was an advocate of colonial prerogatives. In the early years of the American Revolution, the literary celebrity Samuel Johnson famously raised a toast to the next slave insurrection in the West Indies at an Oxford dinner party. By the end of the century then, stories of revolts against slaveholders and the gruesome executions of slave rebels had helped to promote an emerging anti-slavery consciousness, which ultimately enabled the campaigns that turned the British public against the slave trade and slavery in the 19th century. But this all happened too late for the rebels themselves. Like most insurrections, Tacky's war ended badly. The insurgents were killed or captured, publicly executed in grisly displays, or banished from the island, probably along with many bystanders who had taken no part in the fighting. Looking back with a historian's perspective, one can see that the outcome was never really in doubt. The balance of forces doomed the rebellion from the start. The Coromantes would not win the colony from the British, as the North Americans would do two and a half decades later, and as the Haitians would do by 1804, taking Saint-Domingue from the French. But the rebels in Jamaica did not know they would fail. They acted with the hope of success, even amid the business of war and enslavement, in a colony, colony garrisoned for battle with foreign and domestic enemies. They could find fissures in the landscape of planter power beyond the reach of the slaveholders' whips. They could even challenge the combined forces of the British Empire and find an enduring place in popular memory. Tacky's revolt and its reverberations through the 1760s represented a watershed in the course of Atlantic history. 
If regional political maps had been drawn by the wars that opened new territories for cultivation, stimulated the slave trade, and enhanced state power, the slave rebellions etched another record of historical movement. They channeled people into new solidarities and gave meaning to categories of belonging, partitioned friends from foes and bystanders, and redirected the priorities of governing authorities. Since Jamaica was the commercial and military hub of the British American Empire, its most profitable settlement and most powerful overseas military stronghold, what happened there was bound to reverberate widely. Yet, the legacy of the 1760s is ambiguous. At the close of the Seven Years' War, Britain kept its prized colony, though Taki's revolt helped to stimulate an imperial reform effort that provoked the greater challenge on the North American continent. If the Jamaican revolts in some ways anticipated the Haitian Revolution, offering a beacon of hope to the enslaved, they also left black people on the island divided, maroons from free black people from Africans. The Coromantes augmented their reputation as formidable fighters, helping to cast doubts on the wisdom of continuing the transatlantic slave trade, while at the same time strengthening the association between blackness and social danger. Even in the United States, as late as the mid-19th century, anxious slaveholders would refer to potential troublemakers as tackies among us. Perhaps the ambiguous nature of these legacies helps to explain why they register so faintly in the imagination today. The Coromanti Wars that shaped the era don't fit neatly into the prevailing narrative of the rise and progress of liberal freedom even though such small, dirty wars epitomize the relationship between labor, commerce, and global power. They are obscured by the more obvious consequences of the American and Haitian revolutions, which seem to speak more directly to the Western history of, history of liberty. The relative obscurity of these events is also due, I think, to the reluctance to acknowledge slave revolt as an act of war. Few things terrify the wealthy and powerful more than the prospect of losses to the poor and weak, which would signify a world turned upside down. Dominant peoples and nation states develop elaborate conventions for legitimating conflict, maintaining their honor in victory and defeat, and recognizing violence as a regular, if unfortunate, feature of political struggle. But between the powerful and those they dominate by daily habit, there is no limit to the lengths they may go to maintain their supremacy. They will commit atrocities and massacres to be sure, but they will disavow them too. They will refuse to admit that their combatants are legitimate enemies, and they will denigrate the past and present struggles of less powerful peoples. Because slaveholders wrote the first draft of this history, subsequent historiography has strained to escape their point of view. Yet from the margins, Taki's revolt encourages a fresh perspective on the period's political landscape. In the study of slavery, the exploration of politics has taken its horizon to be the coming of general emancipation, which points to the post-revolutionary era in Atlantic history. The 19th century, when the process of emancipation convulsed states from Haiti to Brazil, has come to be seen as a discrete epoch, which threw freedom into sharp relief as an animating force of historical change. Although that era certainly did bring a world historical transformation, Emancipation is the master sign of freedom, binds the ultimate aims and strategies of centuries of anti-slavery struggle to the 19th century, when those efforts reach their apotheosis. Throughout the Atlantic world, the hopeful years immediately following emancipation were followed in most cases by the reassertion of dominance by former slaveholders. The social antagonisms established in slavery govern the tensions that shaped very tenuous liberties. Legacies of slavery persisted through the 19th and 20th centuries reign of white power with continuing manifestations in the present. Yet, struggles against white power were continuous too, during and after slavery. Slaves and their descendants have constantly fought for the space to develop their own notions of belonging, status, and fairness beyond the master's reach. The slave insurrection of the 1760s in Jamaica can justly be narrated as stories of heroism and defeat. Most of the rebels were killed, executed, or forced back into slavery. The memory of their deeds did inspire future generations, but they too would be fighting slaveholders against the longest odds. However, in their courage and ingenuity, 
these insurgents charted the landscape of force and its limitations that the maps of the powerful never meant to show. These counter mappings reveal a geography of hope and possibility in the making. Fugitive territories carved out through political struggle that were difficult to maintain, paradoxical in their alliances, and in most cases, yet to be won. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. I put up that map just so we can continue. I don't want to refer to it. Left or right? How do you do? What, whatever way you uh, you bend. <laughs> I'm just actually there to provide symmetry. Symmetry up there. Um, so we do have a microphone that we're going to run again for our audience. So Tyler there. So if uh, we we'll have time, obviously, for a couple of questions. So if you just want to raise a hand, but please make sure you've got the mic when you're um, when you're speaking. We're um, another point on the seats when you're sitting. Um, you you had a survey, and we would love it if you give it some feedback on this evening's program. Uh, obviously, suggestions for um, future talks. So. Feel free to just leave that with a member of staff in the back afterwards. We also have just a few books. Um, there was a run on the bookstore, um, but we, we're um, actually going to have um, some signed book plates available for those of you um, if you'd like to have one of those to take on and um, affix to a book that you'll be able to come back and um, pick up. And I'd just like to point out our next uh, Read the Revolution speaker is Caitlin Fitz on May 19th um, this spring. Uh, speaking about her book, Our Sister Republics, where we'll be shifting our gaze uh, to the relationship of the young American Republic to uh, Latin American revolutionaries. And so please. Um Professor, thank you so much for that uh, excellent presentation. And pardon my rudeness for holding a glass of wine here, along with my question. Uh, but uh, this was uh, sort of an electric uh, uh, presentation uh, of, of a theme that uh, I became familiar with reading The Slave's uh, Cause, which you probably are very familiar with, uh, which uh, for those who, who, who are unfamiliar with that, it, it spoke about the, the, the uh, lack of appreciation of the comprehensive uh, efforts uh, over the centuries to uh, uh, abolish uh, slavery uh, that were participated in by, by many, many, many peoples and that we don't really appreciate that in, in our study of American history that, that this was such a, an international uh, effort. But uh, specifically for your work, you pinpointed uh, a, a very interesting point in America, the Quakers were at the forefront of the uh, abolitionary movement. Their efforts led mostly to uh, discussion. They were uh, nonviolent. It led to discussion. And yet the, the Baptists in Jamaica uh, did a different thing. They were led more by violent uh, revolution and revolt. And, and that effort seems to have prompted the response of the British government to, to uh, uh, eliminate uh, and abolish slavery, whereas the more peaceful approach obviously did not. Do you have any uh, comment as to that difference? I do have some thoughts. Are we, Ryan, are we good? I do have some thoughts about it. And let me kind of go back to the way I think a lot of times we approach history, um, which is sometimes when we're looking for, you know, heroes and, and first causes and the things we really want to say, this is what mattered rather than all these other things. So we're going to separate out all those causes to find the thing that really mattered, to concentrate on. And that debate that you're talking about really tries to pit... Um, the, the religious reformers of the 18th century, beginning with the Quakers, but moving through a lot of those dissenting 
um, evangelicals who really led the movement in Great Britain against the slave trade against the enslaved and their continuous efforts at anti-slavery over centuries. And I don't really approach history kind of looking to give stickers to, <laughs> you, know, you know, the people I like or don't like. What I'm trying to figure out is how complex causes interrelate, right? So how is it that those religious reformers are responding to the efforts of the enslaved when they see them? And how does that help to stimulate their movements and organization for the abolition of the slave trade? How do all of these things come to factor in the considerations of policymakers? Not sort of choosing one or the other, but how does that predicament that reformers find themselves in face with religious reformers on the one side who are building their political connections and enslaved workers on the other who are refusing to do what, what their masters want them to do? How does that then compel them to make those kinds of choices? And that's what I'm trying to do here. One of the problems is, is we have, so, we have spent so much time um, idealizing and valorizing that religious reform tradition, beginning with the Quakers and moving through, that we haven't spent as much time considering what the enslaved were doing themselves. They haven't seemed to matter as much. So I'm trying to rebalance that picture so we can really get a complete sense of the predicament of people who are thinking, okay, well, maybe slavery is not gonna work for much longer. Because as you mentioned, in 1831, the Baptists lead what becomes the largest slave revolt in the British Empire. Um, this was the largest in the 18th century, that was the largest of all in 1831, and that's when they really give up the game. But they had already been conditioned by decades and generations of anti-slavery reformers in Britain saying there's another way to do this and trying to convince policymakers that you know, slavery was not the only game in town, not the only way to make money through the 19th century. So trying to kind of develop that much more comprehensive picture of how those decisions are made and whose struggles matter is what I'm really after here. Does that make sense? Um, first, and then we'll go, we'll go back. Please, gentlemen in the, in the glasses. Well, first of all, I am not an academic. I'm, I'm, uh, but I was fascinated by uh, your presentation in terms of what goes on in the world today. Uh, learning from history is uh, to uh, provide a perspective on what goes on today. And the issue of looking to more docile, more manageable people that you can, uh, that the business interests can dominate and utilize. I was curious, and, and those uh, enslavers certainly were rational people looking at uh, the world as a business person. And with that in mind, why were the Coromantans the target uh, in the Gold Coast of, uh, for uh, importing slaves rather than, because it appears that their history of being uh, unmanageable, uh, aggressive, uh, uh, militaristic, and not subject to being controlled, why would these uh, importers go to the Gold, Gold Coast and try to uh, bring in that group of people? So, um, you know, planters have all kinds of stereotypes about the people they enslave, right? They have stereotypes about each other, but especially about the people they enslave. Um, and they're, they're often based on the exaggeration of something that they can see, okay? So they're wrong, ultimately, about, you know, native-born populations being more docile. As we just said, you know, the 1831 rebellion, which becomes the largest in the British Empire, is all led by people, native, people who are native-born to the island, not by Africans at all. So kind of that doesn't save them. The problem with slavery is slavery itself, and people resist slavery. Um, but more specifically, why they felt the Coromantes were particularly good, uh, were particularly good agricultural laborers, one, they had a long relationship with the Gold Coast. The British had been trading on the Gold Coast for some time and had trading relationships that developed there over generations, right? So they kind of knew how things operated. They had a network in place there. Um, and so they were familiar with how things would work, and that facilitated the trade, right? So it wasn't, they didn't necessarily have all the choices they wanted to kind of go wherever they did. They were responding um, as much to supply 
as to their own demand, right? So that's one thing. The second thing is, is they had a certain kind of admiration um, because they recognized these martial people as being familiar in some ways. Um, the British had, by the late 17th century and early, 20th, early uh, 18th century, become quite militaristic themselves. Um, and so they recognized in the martial caste of Coromanti people something they could admire and something that conferred honor upon them by having mastered them. And you know what I say this, it's, it's crude, um, and I apologize if it's offensive, but it's almost like the way people like want to domesticate wild horses. It confers more mastery upon the person who can domesticate them, right? And that's their sense of, 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 of the Coromantes too. Now this continues on with, uh, with stereotypes about other people. So the British, but other peoples as well, have these ideas about who martial races are. So in the 19th century, Punjabis and Sikhs become a kind of uh, a characteristic martial race, race, and they draft them into specialized military units within the British Empire, right? They do the same thing in the 20th century with the Zulus, right? Not so much drafting them into the army, but valorizing them as particularly tough people who they can admire in some way, especially because they can now subjugate them. So there's a kind of love-hate relationship, right? Or maybe a kind of desire-fear is a better way to put it, right? They desire to master these Coromantes in part precisely because they are such a challenge. This gets into a kind of psychology. I don't want to go too far down that road. But you can see that playing out certainly over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, could you please talk about the very early stage mechanics of a slave rebellion. What I'm thinking of specifically is, you know, if slavery is well understood and known to be this constant state of war, you know, within the plantation, how do the slaves get the knives that they use to kill their masters or to attack the armory? Um, you know, are these, are they, do they start with knives or do they start with guns? Are the knives things that they are working with in their slave occupations, but if so, why are they allowed to take them home, so to speak, if the whites fear being killed? And then between plantations, you know, how do these things spread? I mean, do they tend to, you know, there was that quote about 400 people knew it and had kept it quiet. Um, do they tend to have a signal that, you know, at such and such a time, many plantations are gonna rise, or do plantations see one uh, neighboring plantations, you know, where it succeed and it sort of spreads like that. I mean, I'm very interested in how it even begins in a situation where, you know, the slave owners know that this can happen and presumably are doing everything that they can to stop it and prevent it. Yeah, it's a great question. I could go into a lot of detail that's in the book, but so let me just kind of say something much more general than that, which is, you know, this is a society in which 90% of the population is enslaved, right? So. If you would, so that means that you are depending on some enslaved people to help keep control of other enslaved people, which means that they have the instruments of, the, of that control. The man that I mentioned, Wager, a Pongo, is in fact a driver on that Royal Navy Sea Captain's plantation. And as a driver, he's got a position of authority over other slaves on behalf of the overseer and the planter. And yet, if he decides to turn on the overseer and the planter, using the authority granted by them to actually organize a rebellion, that plantation might be quickly lost, right? And so there's got to be a kind of careful negotiation between the, the owner or the overseer and that person of authority who's enslaved. There's a, there's a, you have to give special favors, right? An independent house, access to the implements uh, and tools for hunting, right? So knives and sometimes even guns. And so you're trusting that they are so keen to protect their access to those special favors that they'll continue to remain allied with you rather than aligning with the mass of the enslaved population. And in that, these linguistic divisions, religious divisions, ethnic divisions help, right? You would like to keep that 90% of the enslaved population divided among themselves and offer some special favors to the people who are gonna help you keep control of that so you can kind of manage your situation. More directly, Yes, they all, a lot of them have cane knives, and they don't collect all the cane knives at the end of the day. And when they do, there are not that many people guarding them, and all you have to do is convince one person, right, 
who's guarding the cane knives to let you at the cane knives. Once you have some of those cane knives, as you saw in that picture, that is a representation of the initial storming of the fort at Fort Haldane, where they collected muskets uh, and powder um, to lead the next parts of the rebellion. So they kind of move point to point, gathering what weapons they can and trying to gather other people into the revolt. Among the signals that the revolt is succeeding is fire. So they set these plantations alight so that everybody who's been told, sorry, everybody who has been told um, around the area that the revolt is going to happen um, knows when the fire goes up that now is the time. And that's when they overwhelm the one person who might be guiding the cane knives or the weapons on that plantation. And that's kind of how it works, right? By those signals and by the fact that if they have done their organizing work properly, again, identified uh, friends from foes carefully over a long period of time, when things go off, things can happen quite quickly. I spend much more time going into the mechanics of the revolt in the book, but that should give you a general sense of how it works. Early on in your presentation, you had a slide um, said 1661 to 1765 and the most frequent destinations, and you yeah. talked about the various islands. How was it determined, you know, in some cases you had tens of thousands of people, other cases you had hundreds of thousands of peoples. How was it determined that some went to Barbados, the easternmost island, some went to Jamaica? How were those destinations determined? Yeah, okay, so that depends on the kind of merchant networks, and then there's, you know, it's, it's largely demand. Um, and also what kind of particular merchant networks connect to what kind of places, right? So the trade at the Gold Coast, um, every European power is involved to some degree, but the British, the Dutch, and the Danish are taking more, greater numbers of people from that particular region of coast than, than other European slave trading powers, right? And so those people that the British, the Danish, and the Dutch are, go, are, are taking are coming to their biggest, most productive, most profitable colonies, right? So Jamaica gets the lion's share of those in part because they have so many planters demanding so many workers that, and they have a network to the Gold Coast. A lot of the planters have invested in ships trading to the Gold Coast because they prize people from that particular region, because they know people who trade to that particular region regularly, they have long contacts, and so they wind up getting greater numbers of people than people in some of those more marginal colonies, right? So if you've got a region that's favored by merchants, then the number of people coming, the percentage of people coming, the scale of the trade is probably gonna be determined then by who in the colonies has the business relationship to connect to that source of supply. Does that make sense? And one of the best places to kind of go and look at how this plays out over time is the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, where I drew, where I drew those numbers from. Uh, that is a database that has the records of about 35, maybe almost 40,000 ships now. Um, and it's trying to come up with an accurate estimate of regional um, um, departures and destinations across the Atlantic for the entire, you know, four centuries of the trade. Uh, front here and then there. Thank you. Um, I wanted to see if you could speak to um, how you view this history in a contemporary context. When we look at the persistence of white supremacy over centuries and centuries, and the reality of it still today, um, what is your um, uh, view of all of this history and how it has evolved and what we today can learn from it to address these incredible inequities that still persist along racial lines. Great question and a question that takes me kind of away from my work as a historian, but I'll speak to you as a citizen, <laughs> right? Um, and kind of why, I, why I'm particularly engaged with this kind of history um, in part because of the, you know, some of, the, some of the troubles that I see in our society. Um, I think a couple of things. Like one, there are continuous patterns that endure over very, very long periods of time, right? So, you know, the origin of the word slave is derived from Slav, because Slav, Slavic peoples were traded across the, 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 Baltic, sea, the Baltic Sea slave trade for a very long time 
before what we call the fall of Constantinople, right? And the movement of European traders out across the Mediterranean into the Atlantic, where they began to rely ever more heavily on enslaved Africans to do that kind of work. But the word is still with us, right? The kind of the pattern, Slav as slave, is still there in our language. I do think about that with the expectations that come with social relationships as well. Over centuries, African phenotypical features came to signify low social status, right? And even after the end of legal slavery, those features still came to signify descent from low social status, right? So even in places where, where the laws worked radically differently, like say in different parts of, of Latin America, right, where the laws weren't the same, you still find associations between black phenotypical features, African phenotypical features, and low social status because of those centuries of slavery. And those expectations take different forms in the way that the laws work, in the way culture works, in the way society is organized, right? Now, that's a kind of abstract way of saying we are still contending with those enduring patterns. And yet one of the things that's important to me is that people were fighting against those kinds of discrimination even at its height, even at its most extreme, even during slavery, right? Those struggles are as continuous as white supremacy itself, right? Um, or white power itself and racism itself. And I wanna emphasize that it's only those struggles or it's mostly those struggles, going back to the previous question, which helped to change things for the better. And so that's kind of my, my engagement with this history in terms of the present, right? Understanding that the situation we find ourselves in today has historical origins, right? That the patterns, maybe it started a long time ago, but that the struggles against those discriminatory patterns are continuous too, and I want to identify with those, right? Not just to give a sticker, <laughs> but because, you know, we are still living that history. Well, if I can uh, just... A quick final question before we go uh, and adjourn for some uh, book signing times. I just wanted to ask you about your um, engagement with landscape. You know, the Museum of the American Revolution here at 3rd and Chestnut Street, um, the kind of history of American slavery and American liberty is just woven into the neighborhood that we're, that we're sitting in. I'm just curious, this is a transatlantic story that you've told. How much of the landscape of your story have you been able to, to travel to and, and see, and how has that maybe affected your, um, your perspective and your work? Yeah, thanks for that question. I want to answer it a couple of ways. Like, so one of the, 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 the driving ideas behind this book is that we can remap the way the history looks and reshape our conventional expectations for who matters, what matters, and where things matter. So I'm really trying to kind of integrate the map of the Atlantic world so we can see how things that happen in West Africa reverberate through the Americas, right? Things that happen in Jamaica reverberate back to Europe. So fundamentally, that's a kind of geographic process. But I don't just want to see that on a two-dimensional map from 30,000 feet. I try to locate that kind of in the particular landscapes that I'm talking about so we can see the connections between what happens in West Africa, what happens in a particular parish on a particular plantation in Jamaica, and what might happen in London uh, or even Boston or Philadelphia later, right? So your question was, did I spend time in those landscapes? Some. Certainly in West Africa, I spent uh, quite a bit of time on, in Ghana on the Gold Coast going to, to many of those, those slave forts, those castles. And some of them are now like UNESCO World Heritage Sites and they're, you know, they're almost like tourist traps um, which they're impressive, you can go and look, but they don't have the, the kind of feeling of, 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 uh, of really the horror and the terror that I imagine must have had in the 18th century. It's only when you get out to some of the smaller forts, and it turns out there's a fort called Anamabo, which was in the mid 18th century the most heavily trafficked fort on the Gold Coast, but it hasn't become a World Heritage Site. It hasn't been, you know, kind of redone um, and dressed up, and there are not a lot of tourists there, but I went there with another historian, or, or two or three, um, one early morning, just before sunrise, when I'm driving out from Elmina to Anamabo, and there I was on the beach um, at this fort, and there my imagination, in some ways, knowing what I knew about the history and being in the place could give me a sense of engagement with that history that was much deeper than I found um, 
in the well-touristed forts at Elmina and Cape Coast Castle. Um, and that was quite, quite powerful. Again, nothing that was conveyed directly by the history, but by my investment of imagination in being in that place. And the same thing has happened in various places in Jamaica um, as, I've, as I've thought about this history. But very much, it's a, it's a history of like how it is that one connects up different landscapes so that we can tell a story that looks quite different than the national histories that we generally know. Thank you for that. And can we thank Vince for a fabulous evening? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And um, if any of you uh, would like a book signing or just a, a chance to, um, to speak um, with Vincent, we'll adjourn out to the uh, hallway. Thank you for being here.